So just to start a bit of context, uh, we're going to define what we are going to use for this talk. And just so you know, the talk is available at my GitHub repository and everything is there, demo, examples, and this very talk and its sources. So in Python, the package is usually a tree of files uh, containing a special file. The name of the root folder is the name of the package and you can import it under the right conditions. So you can temper with the import paths or something. There were a lot of super interesting talk about uh, different features which um, modify the way import machinery works in Python. And well, uh, in some system, in some context, we actually do use the, those for legitimate reason. For example, in Nix, um, we uh, use PTH files and sites to um, make it easy to import any package uh, in an isolated way, uh, like virtual env enables you to do so. Uh, so everything we install from any PyPI like server um, is a package and every package manager you've used is also something that provides for package and use these indexes. So now thinking about people like us, users, uh, we install packages uh, manually, we type in our terminal or by using uh, graphical interfaces uh, to install some packages that could be NumPy, that could be SciPy, that could be whatever you need. And uh, we do install those on a computer. Uh, we're running a certain operating system, and on this computer, there are things. Those things are some source code, SSH keys, personal file, professional file, secrets. And to us, they, they might be something that we don't care about, that may be something that we forgot that we have, um, but to other people, that might become, they might become valuable targets. And that's really important to think about this because uh, the computer that we carry on contains very important data and some people try to enforce the fact that you have to encrypt your computer to prevent for uh, data loss and catastroph catastrophic failures. Um, and we can also extend these kind of ideas to servers and deployments because they're kind of the same except that you replace the human interaction by automation. So some valuable targets reachable at install time when you install a package are SSH keys, SSH servers, browser profiles, uh, and whatever you name it. Uh, because uh, all of those are available in your user. So sometimes you can try to do things to isolate uh, where you're installing your packages. So you use Docker or you use something like that. Uh, but not everyone does that. Not every package manager provides for package, package isolation. So yeah. Um, just a quick reminder, how to publish a package to PyPI. Uh, we read down instructions uh, to use our package, so meta, some metadata, and we perform some operations. Uh, I think it's really interesting that uh, the most easiest way to describe how to publish a package is that at install time we perform some operations. Because uh, historic, historically, uh, in order to install a package, you have to read down a setup.py, which is a fully um, complete Python program, uh, which exposes this install command, and you can run everything in this install command. Uh, and this code gets shipped to PyPI and is run arbitrarily when you run, when you install your package. So maybe we don't really care about uh, the fact that we can run arbitrary code uh, at install time. But unfortunately, uh, we have some example of annoying things and really bad things done with, the, with, with these fixtures. So for example, uh, date util is very known, a very known package to deal with dates. And uh, some people, or some of you, might remember the Python 2 to Python 3 transition, which was quite painful. And some packages we, which were not compatible with Python 3 started to create uh, new pa packages compatible under the name Python 3-package. And of course, someone published the Python 3 dash that util package, but that was not an uh, innocent package. So uh, on 2019, uh, someone published a malicious package behind this, uh, which was which were depending on a jellyfish package uh, and playing uh, with a homoglyph attack, uh, playing on the I or L uh, confusion. And this payload tried to attack a very specific person uh, because if you unpack everything, gets the code extra, which is on the issue, by the way, uh, you can see that it was trying to test if someone had a very specific file 
uh, which had not a very random name or one was not on every computer. So um, we can infer that it was a quite sophisticated attack towards one developer. Uh, so it's quite frightening and, and makes you wonder uh, how uh, frequent these attacks are, in fact. And uh, some other talks, talks about that. Uh, there are a lot of malicious packages which use this typo squatting or even like, uh, I think, honest uh, typo squatting. Um, some package were definitely downloaded too much, uh, for example, DPP client. Uh, and recently, PyPI rolled out mandatory two-factor authentication for critical packages. Um, and you might have noticed this last week there, there was some drama about it because um, uh, PyPI did a great job, I think, giving out uh, free two-factor authentication to critical package maintainers. Uh, but some maintainers didn't want to enable two-factor authentication, so they uh, argued that it's it's something, it's like, if you are a maintainer of some package for free software, uh, are you really uh, concerned about the security of your users? And I think that's a philosophical question, so let's put it aside. Um, the question we ask is why uh, arbitrary code execution is needed? Uh, most of the package we install are mostly declare, declaring their, their dependencies. So uh, we say that uh, NumPy depends on some uh, numerical library and so on and so forth. And PIP or any package manager use this to perform some topological sort and version resolution. Um, but our, our, our formats, our, the way how we describe our package does, does not take into account uh, the problem that uh, comes with system level dependencies. So when you install something like Beautiful Soup, which comes with a HTML parser, you need some XML parser, and you want a fast XML parser, so LXML is a one co good candidate, and it qu requires to install uh, C libraries, so you have to coordinate with System Package Manager. You have also the problem of when you're using numerical libraries, such as Cypher and NumPy. Uh, you can change the inner uh, acceleration uh, to choose an acceleration which works better on your hardware. So for Intel MKL, you will get better acceleration on Intel-based processors. Uh, OpenBlast is the generic implementation which works quite fine for every processor uh, which was run by the research. And you have the same for AMD and so on and so forth. Same for TensorFlow and CUDA because you have some specific specifics about GPUs. And uh, you have non purely Python packages also uh, which are writ written in another language, such as Rust, must be compiled and exposed to your Python package. And uh, when you pip install such a package and you don't have any will for it, uh, you need to build it. And Python is not going to install a Rust compiler for you, so the author is going to install a Rust compiler for you. Um, and you have many other examples of why this is needed. So we can argue that maybe that's the wrong model and should do something else extra. But that's the reality, so we have to work with, uh, with this. And this is possible because there is no real alternative to the problem. There was some interesting talk about the update framework and, and many other attempts to, to try to solve this problem. But not all can account for everything I just mentioned. And this is still very a work in progress. Uh, so one of the problem I think is, is, is hard here is that not only you have to support like Linux distribution, we, which all have their way to do things. Uh, some are source-based, you take Arch Linux, Gain2, and so on and so forth. Some are binary-based, Debian, Ubuntu, etc. And they don't necessarily agree on who is responsible to bring you the, the final mile of dependency. Uh, and also, what something I, I don't say is about Windows, Mac OS, and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, software authors have to make assumptions. Um, there are no easy way to discover some standard, standard sometimes. So, for example, when you do a say library uh, or native library, you can use something called pkg-config to discover library paths and pass parameters to your compiler. And that requires you to provide a PC file. And sometimes upstream developers forget about them and downstream, develop, da downstream maintainers have to add them manually, but they don't necessarily get them upstream, so it creates a lot of fragmentation and difficulties to, to handle everything. So downstream motors have to do workarounds. Python developers, Python package, packager uh, have to do something in their setup.py so that the experience is streamlined and very user-friendly. Uh, and as a result, 
uh, you have a, a great success of using something like Docker and Friends because they provide a streamlined experience in a clean state, uh, which would be here a container. Um, so we could decide that, yeah, that's the state of thing and we might need to restart uh, packaging someday and, and do it fine, do it good, and get some 10 years milestone uh, plan to, to get us there. Uh, but this talk is about Nix. So let's do a Nix crash course. Um, what is Nix? So the idea behind Nix is a functional uh, Nix language. And it's a general package manager, which is able to work with other package managers. The provoking idea of Nix is we break the file system hierarchy standard, so you don't get any slash US or extra. You only get your state files, so slash home and, and so on and so forth. And everything is a sim link of something in the Nix store. So that makes it really easy to reason about what you have in your system. And everything is recorded, and you have a cryptographic hash. We'll come back to the cryptographic hash later. Um, packages are not really packages in Nix. We don't have any concept of packages. We have concept of derivation, which is a more general concept. And uh, we express something in the Nix language and produce outputs. So that can be a package, that can be a system that you need file, that can be a bash script, that can be a Python script, uh, everything goes. So here's an example of um, uh, file system hierarchy standard. Um, you can find those uh, as being SRV, USR, VAR, that you often find on your system. But on Nix, those either don't exist or are symlink of a special Nix store path. So just to get some example uh, of what is Nix, uh, here's the Nix language now. So this is an expression to build uh, a Python package. So you have some import of the package, the list of packages we have. So this is a function sign signature. Uh, we have a function call, uh, we call the build Python package function. Uh, we give a name, we give version, we give the source. Uh, notice that we give the hash. That's something that prevents, um, in Nix network RSS is disabled, except for um, derivation which have a hash so that we can already know the result in advance. So if by, by PI try to change uh, the contents, uh, the result would be rejected because the hash would change. So this protects us a bit, but not a lot. Um, and we have some metadata about uh, the package. So the, um, the next path. So we said that we have a next path here is the cryptographic hash. Um, a nice property of next is that this cryptographic hash uniquely identifies your, your package. Um, either things are input address, that means that your package is function of the inputs. If you change NumPy and you depend on NumPy, your package is going to change. Um, or either content addressed, that means that either if NumPy change, changes, but your result won't change because it's a minor API uh, bump or something, uh, the hash won't change. So that's really interesting because you never build software twice, except for very good reasons. And uh, that makes it trivial to cache uh, derivations and provide them to everyone. Um, and then you get a nice, a nice name. And get now, now you get something that you, you, you all used to, which is the, ba the bin folder, the lib folder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here are some glossary, basic glossary of the Nix terms. I'm going to go fast on them. Um, the Nix store is the file system where everything is recorded, including the derivations. The store path is uh, either outputs produced by a derivation file or a, der a derivation file itself. So you can send derivation to someone else and you can build it for you uh, and you can get the outputs. Um, derivation is the receipt. So when you say I want to build uh, tools like we s we, we've seen earlier, you say that this is a, a Python package and all Python package have a way to be built, uh, which is running the setup.py and, uh, and then we just give some parameters that we need, so the source, the name, the version, uh, some, metadata, some metadata. Uh, and what is interesting about it is that even a full NixOS Linux system is just one big derivation, which is your kernel, your init um, your boot script, extra, extra. And you can have a tree, which I, I will showcase uh, later, of uh, your whole system. Uh, and then the, the mathematical concept of closure, which is that when you have a re binary relation such as software X depend on software Y, uh, often in the packaging ecosystem, you want to get the closure of this. So we, you look at the graph and you say, okay, I'm going to get all the packages I need 
which depends all on themselves so that I can have the full software package and working on my computer. So in Nix, we often talk about closure of the software, and that means the transitive closure behind the binary relation of dependencies. Um, so now maybe I lost some people of the audience, and maybe a question I would, I would ask is, how many people are using Nix here? Yeah. Well, that's cool for all the newcomers here. Um, so maybe it's a bit obscure so far, and it's very normal because that's how Nix is perceived by a lot of people. And um, one, tri one thing it tries to do is to use theoretical framework to get the complexity of software tamed. So as a goal, we, Nix has always, has always have had build reproducibility. So what I explained about input address or content address. So once you build a software once, you can retry to rebuild it and you will get the same very package. Um, something later on that will be funny. Um, and build operation are sandbox by default. So net, no network access, no arbitrary access to the, the user file system, or even installed dependencies. I cannot try to see if you have like, I don't know, NumPy installed if I don't need NumPy. So uh, that's pretty powerful because it will help us to uh, see what the software is actually doing in the sandbox. And uh, you still have escape hatches. Uh, if you take some software like Steam, um, well, Steam is a very bad behaving software because it brings its own libraries because it's trying to solve the problem of libraries. So some games uh, are not statically linked. They come with their libraries and Nix doesn't take the library of others. So we have to make it pretend live in a file system hierarchy standard using namespaces. And yeah, everyone is able to use Steam on NixOS, even if it looks like quite hard. Um, composition with local package manager is interesting and important. Nix is not about reinventing the wheel. It's not about like taking over pip or poetry. It is trying to work with pip and poetry so that it can handle the thing that the distribution, the Linux distribution has to handle, while pip and poetry focuses on what it has to solve. Um, and trivial caching, as we have reproducibility, uh, Nix provides a very big uh, binary cache, uh, which has everything you contain. So even though NixOS is a source-based distribution, uh, you don't recompile that much. Uh, I think the only time I recompile is because I'm changing something in C compiler and I'm recompiling the whole word. Um, so I think that this, this chart for repology.org shows something very interesting that um, Nix has a lot of package projects and non unique package projects. And of course, it's because we are automating a lot of packaging and we are like eating uh, packages from PyPI and so on and so forth. But we're doing that with uh, a lot less maintainers uh, than something like the Arc Linux user repository. Um, and I think that's very interesting to, 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 to see that um, because we have a lot of data on what is packaging, what is a package, and how people use this package, and what does this package does. Um, we have a minimal image. Uh, we have uh, came very far on reproducibility on that. And um, we have only two paths which are not reproducible. So this is the, the website tracking NixOS reproducibility. So it's trying every path that is a derivation in the minimal image and trying to see if it can rebuild it twice on a different kernel, different hardware, different machine, different time, um, and see if there are there any differences. So, um, for Py so as you can see, Python and Rust something uh, are not reproducible. Um, sometimes we're at 100% and sometimes we're not. Uh, so it's, uh, it's continuously test. And as you can see, we can look very deep into the problem and see that um, some PyC file is changing when you re we're rebuilding twice. So maybe non-deterministic optimization or um, timestamp related issue. And that's pretty cool to be able to do that. Um, so the question now is how we can leverage Nix as a tool. So as Nix is very strict and the word outside is quite forgiving, uh, we have to not re-implement the wheel, we have to reuse existing tool uh, like Pip and Poetry, but we have to let 
Nix handle the downloading, the native dependency sourcing, and capture something in a Nix expression. And we put pip and poetry and every tooling that we use like this in an offline mode. Uh, that means that we instruct pip to say that we're going to do, do an offline install and should rely on not using network access. So for now, I'm going to do use a very simple demo um, of that. So here's a Nix common. Uh, where I'm going to, to, to create a shell. So Nix shell is very interesting because it's, uh, you're all used to virtual env. Well, Nix shell is virtual env generalized to everything. So you can uh, use any package, any binary, temporarily in some sort of virtual env, and once you exit the shell, uh, those packages are not in your environment anymore. So what I'm going to do is to have a Python 3.9 uh, environment with some known to be annoying package to install sometimes on some systems and show that it's quite easy and what happened when you do that of course so you can see that i i, I made a rookie mistake which is uh, assuming that bash was available in my path it is not uh, I have to use env, which is uh, the POSIX standard for that. And um, you can see that Nix is going to, to compute the, the closure of uh, the packages I asked. Uh, so I have some nice uh, information about the download size, the impact size, and get everything that I need. So it's doing the, the work and downloading. And now I'm creating the environment. So I'm in the Nix shell right now. So I do have NumPy. I do have SignPy. I do have TensorFlow. and PyTorch. Um, once I exit this, um, this shell, you can see that I don't have those package in my environment. So it's indeed working. And I can perform some advanced stuff on this thing because I can change uh, the, inner, the inherent numerical, numerical library. So I can do Intel MCAL based NumPy or SciPy. Uh, and it's quite easy. This package, this uh, script can be cached so that I can share it with viewers and they can have the instant shell and not download, uh, not build a lot of things. So it's quite cool. And continuous integration becomes a lot easier to test with, the, with these kind of fixtures. And the second demo is about a self-contained script. Uh, sometimes we build some scripts, one line script, one file script, sorry. And um, we don't use uh, external dependencies because it's annoying to package them or to package a one file script with, pack with dependencies. So here's an example we request. So I just want to do request get uh, error patent .io. Uh, I don't have request in my environment. Uh, I don't want to install request. I would like to share this file with friends that might use this package, um, might use this script rather. And you can see that my um, code tool is not finding request. But I can still run it and get an answer because um, Nix shell can be used as an interpreter uh, for shebangs, which is a feature of the shells. And this way, you can do self-contained Python script trivially. So we've seen how Nix can be leveraged as a tool for doing Python development. Uh, we didn't showcase how to do Python deployment, but the idea is the same. You build some closure, you send it to the remote server, and the remote server just use it. Uh, you can do a lot of advanced stuff meanwhile. You can check that the closure is, co is coherent with something. You can see the closure. You can generate a software view of materials, uh, and uh, a lot of stuff. 
But the problem with Nix is that its learning curve is quite insane. So uh, not a lot of people are uh, that much gray beard, but some tries. Uh, and uh, Nix is like very frustrating for new users uh, used to download binaries from the internet and trying to run them. Uh, we have solutions for that, but uh, it's still not easy. Um, and Nix cannot solve everything. So uh, Nix cannot solve uh, things that were not um, built for Nix, uh, meaning that we have a system to determine which packages is hit by CVU. But uh, have you ever seen a CVU informing you about the very function who is uh, affected in the security vulnerability? Uh, so y you cannot like uh, say that this is the, this particular function which is affected. Uh, this is the hash of this function. This is the hash of the code. So uh, we cannot automate easily um, whether we are affecting or not by a CVE. That's something which is a work in progress. Uh, CVE are very granular. Sometimes uh, they say to you that in your dependency you have a package uh, who is vulnerable, but in fact you're never using the package, so you're not affected. Uh, and Nix cannot solve that. Tooling that takes log files and produces Nix expression are not enough. You have a lot of edge cases, including in the Python uh, registry. Sometimes some URLs are not stable, and you have to try to predict things and try to find out about hashes and so on and so forth. So it's a bit difficult. Uh, today, there is um, a bug on poetry, uh, which uh, breaks a lot of things. And I just got hit by it, and I wanted to do a third demo, but it doesn't work. Um, limits of the standards are also uh, complicated to work around. Um, if you take a, cr a crate like cryptography, which is a Python package for uh, doing crypto, um, we have to do this kind of workaround uh, to support it because uh, it brings a Rust compiler in the, in the play. And unfortunately, um, the files doesn't bring any ashes about the, the, the ash of the dependencies of the, the, the Rust uh, project. So we have downstream to support that and try to work around behind the fact that if you are under a certain version, we should use the wheel. If not, we can compile it. Uh, and here are the dependencies hashed, and we can use it, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very, very complicated. So we have been working with cryptography guys on that, but the format doesn't support it, so it's hard. Uh, and advanced attackers, we just moved to bug doors. And now it gets very complicated. It's not, it's not a technical problem. Um, so we need, in the future, more foundational work to be compatible with Python. Um, we disable bytecode optimization because the virus are not determinism. Uh, we disable, we're not using a lot of wheels because uh, it's super hard to get right the many Linux ABI problems. But at the same time, we have things like TrustX, which solve distributed trust issue. When you have multiple binary cache, how do you trust this binary cache, what is your policy? Do you want to do a majority vote? You ask every cache uh, what is their cryptography hash, and you say that uh, if uh, the majority vote in favor of a hash and something is not doing it, uh, then you reject this cache. So it's quite interesting. We have the Salsa framework, um, which is a framework pushed by some big corp uh, tech companies. Uh, to get high level of assurances in your supply chain in integration with the ecosystem is, are being published at the moment. So the conclusion is installing packages in Python is dangerous by construction. Fixing this is complicated. Uh, attacks are running in the wild and we can only measure the public surface. Raising the cost for attackers is quite easy uh, by constraining the attack surface with Nix at least. And uh, the real win are, in fact, that we have a lot of data produced by Nix. We have the integration with the external ecosystem. Doing multi-language project becomes easier with Nix. And um, that's pretty much it. I uh, will left you with some references and do some QA if I have time for it. <laughs>